Hey, what's up, my brothers and sisters, family and friends? Our main text for today is in Philippians chapter 2. And if you're hearing this, I just want to say that I hope that you're doing well. I hope that you, you and your family are healthy and full of peace. It doesn't take a prophet today to look around at our world and to recognize that something is deeply wrong in our world. I mean, first of all, we are in the midst of a global pandemic. A, a virus has emerged and spread and killed around 400,000 people in just a few months, and it has kept the rest of us physically separated for that time. Something is deeply wrong in our world. We are so politically divided and socially divided that even this pandemic has become divisive. And if we take a moment and step back, we see that there are forces at work, demonic forces, powers, and human agents that spend their time and energy taking every event, every story, and every issue and spinning it so that their side looks good and right, and they do so by demonizing the other side. And back and forth it goes. And as a result, we are intensely divided and it is destroying us from within. Something is deeply wrong in our world. Yes, there is disease and division. And yes, there is selfishness and pride and perversion that is deep in the human heart. And that sin works itself out into society through things like discrimination, injustice, violence, and more. The horrible killing of George Floyd just last week and the various responses to it have once again shed light on these problems. Something is deeply wrong in our world. And I think that it may be important for us to hear afresh in this season that it is only from a position of privilege that this kind of brokenness and injustice might somehow seem new. You see, in most, if not all, societies throughout human history, there have been within those societies different strata of people, different classes or, or different groups who experience life in that society in very different ways. There's often a group of people who live most of their lives in relative peace and with a relative confidence that the societal systems in place will keep things safe and fair for them. Yes, of course, they deal with things like sin and evil and death for sure, but they are able to live most of their lives without this clear sense that something is deeply wrong with our world, or at least their world. And then there is often another group of people whose entire lives from birth to grave is marked by a clear sense and a real feeling that things are not fair. That things are not right and that this world, our world, is deeply broken. And I know that some of you who are hearing this right now have experienced that firsthand. You know deep in your bones that something is deeply wrong in our world. And the rest of us, especially those of us, myself included, who have lived our lives comfortably as part of the majority culture, it is in mo I believe it is in moments like these, by God's grace, that we get to more clearly see what we may have missed before. It is in unique cultural moments like these that we get to more clearly see what the scriptures have actually proclaimed all along. Something is deeply wrong in our world. And my dear brothers and sisters, this holy text before us today points us toward a revolution that can change all of it. This text here in Philippians chapter 2 points us to the only thing, hear that, to the only thing that can rightly overthrow the status quo and move us and our world toward real and lasting unity, peace, reconciliation, healing, and change. And oh man, may it be so. And as we've been saying, this writing that we call Philippians is a letter 
that was written by the Apostle Paul, who we believe at the time was in prison in the city of Rome, and he was writing to the church, the community of Jesus followers, clear over in the city of Philippi. And we believe that this writing is part of the scriptures. It is part of the inspired words of God, and therefore, that it is useful for teaching us, and that it is useful for rebuking us where we need to be rebuked, and for correcting us where we need to be corrected, and for training us, I love that word, and for training us in right kingdom living. In other words, we believe that there is no other writing like this in the world and that it is designed to move us toward God and toward his kingdom and as a result to change us, to really change us, our attitudes, our thinking, and how we live as we engage with it. And that is amazing. And what's fascinating about this particular writing within the scriptures is that at the very center of it is a poetic song. The Apostle Paul constructed this letter as a series of of short thoughts or vignettes, and all of them orbit around a song. And it's not clear if Paul is the one who wrote the song or if someone else did and Paul inserted it into the letter, but what is clear is is that the song is the structural and artistic and theological epicenter of the writing. It's one of the most studied, this song, this text is one of the most studied texts in all of the New Testament. It contains many allusions to the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament. It is deep and rich, and it is all about Jesus. We might call it, as some have, an ode to King Jesus, or maybe even an ode to the humble king. And because of its centrality in this writing, and because of where we are in this unique cultural moment, I have just sensed that it would be good and right for us as a church to slow down and to spend a couple weeks looking at it. And then after we do that, by God's grace, we'll pick the pace back up as we walk through the rest of the writing. And before I read the text here, I just want to say that this message today is going to be intentionally unfinished. There's going to be some loose ends, and I want to leave us hanging a bit because what I want to do is stir us up. I want to lovingly, I pray that the Spirit of God powerfully stirs us up by calling us to do two things this week. Number one, I'm calling us to consider the question, what is our response to the broken, to that which is deeply wrong in our world? What is our response to that which is deeply wrong in our what what is your response what is my response and what is our response as a church not what is the world's response but as the church as followers of Jesus what is our response what has been our response and what will be our response going forward that's that's the first part of the call here today to consider to honestly prayerfully lean in and consider the question, what is our response to that which is deeply wrong in our world? And number two, I'm calling us to get this song here deep within us. I'm calling us to get this ancient inspired song, an ode to King Jesus, deep and deeper within us. To to read it again and again this week. I I want to encourage us on this and even challenge us to read this text again and again and again, to memorize it if you're able to do that, to study it, to paraphrase it in your own writing, or to create some art based upon it. And whatever that might look like for you and for your family, church, let's find some ways to get this song deeper in us and let's see what our God does as a result. And everybody who is on board for those two things agreed and said, Amen. Here's the song. Actually, I'm going to start in verse 5, the line before it. The Apostle Paul writes, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as King Jesus. Who? Now, so here's, here's the song. Here's the ode to the humble king. Who? Being in very nature God, 
did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Some translations say something to be grasped, like Adam and Eve grasping for that fruit. But rather, he made himself nothing. He emptied himself. And he didn't empty himself of his godness or his divinity, but rather he emptied himself of the glory that goes with it. And he did so by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself. He lowered himself by becoming obedient to death. And so notice here, as many have pointed out, this this downward trajectory of the song. God himself came as a human, and he humbly served, and he sacrificially obeyed, clear to the point of death. But then it's like it goes even lower than that. By becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, and now notice here the the artistic upward movement of the song, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every single knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every single tongue confess that Jesus the Messiah is Lord that Jesus is king to the glory of God the Father whether it was Paul or whoever wrote that was they were on fire when they did with the spirits for spirit of the living gods fire. that is an ode to king jesus for the past two weeks now we all know that people have been posting and protesting in cities across the world and right here in our own city and one of the words that's been getting used is the word revolution People are looking for, sometimes even longing for, a revolution. And a revolution is an overthrow of a system in favor of a new one. A a revolution is often the the forcible overthrow of one system, of of a government or a regime or, or some kind of power in favor of a new one. It begins with this clear sense and this deep belief that something is wrong with the current system. And the idea is that now is the time to overthrow it and to start a new one. And that's a revolution. In the late 1700s, again, as you know, the people of the American colonies wanted their independence from the rule and taxation of King George and Great Britain. And so they launched the American Revolution. Around that same time, the French people were fed up with the monarchy and the feudal system. And so they launched the French Revolution. In 1989, the people of Czechoslovakia overthrew the totalitarian regime there in what is often called the Velvet Revolution. And somewhere around 10 to 15 years ago, when the world was overcome with boredom and stagnation, many people participated in Dance Dance Revolution. My dear brothers and sisters, as followers of Jesus, we are part of a revolution. In fact, be reminded today that we are part of the greatest revolution in the history of the world. And as a side note, I just want to say that if you are hearing this message and you are not yet a follower of Jesus, I want you to know that Jesus is calling. Maybe maybe you are tired of what you see around you. Maybe sick and tired, sad, mad, furious, or maybe all, maybe you are longing for some kind of revolution. And again, I say to you lovingly and boldly, Jesus is calling and he is the one and his is the revolution that you have been longing for all along. And he's calling you to himself. You see, the scriptures proclaim that there is a power at work and a system in place in our world that is deeply warped, twisted, and broken. And remember, that was not God's design. 
No, the scriptures proclaim that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, the universe, our world, and all that is in it. And in the beginning, God, the creator, God looked at it and he said, it is good, completely, thoroughly, and very good. And yet, I mean, look around. When we look around at our world, our cities, and when we look at the story the scriptures proclaim, we see that something is wrong with the current system. We see that as a result of human rebellion against God, a new world order has been put in place. One built on things like selfishness, greed, pride, prejudice, injustice, and perversion. Since the events of Genesis chapter 3, there have been dark powers that promote one person, fighting against another, one group exploiting another, or ignoring another, or trying to overthrow another. And the whole system is broke. And it creates societies that are just drenched in fear, and racism, and poverty, and materialism, and nationalism, and evil of all kinds, and eventually death. And here's the thing. We are all part of it. And the story, the the good news story, the scriptures proclaim, is that God has promised to overthrow it. The good and holy God promised to overthrow the broken system that was instigated by idolatry and put forth by the powers of evil. And this is what happened at the cross. It says Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And that was the moment the revolution began. And my dear brothers and sisters, be again, be reminded today, we are invited to be part of it. You see, when you became a follower of Jesus, you didn't sign up to be a passenger along for the ride. And you didn't sign up to be a consumer of religious goods and services. No, you signed up to be a sent and empowered by God revolutionary in the name of Jesus. Church, right now, today, we are part of the greatest revolution in the history of the world. One that is meant to change everything that is broken and sinful in our lives and everything that is broken and sinful in our world. And in Philippians chapter 2, we find our revolution song. In fact, I believe that this is the most revolutionary song that has ever been sung. This ode to King Jesus points us to the only thing that can rightly overthrow the status quo and move us and our world toward real and lasting unity, peace, reconciliation, healing, equality, and change. And again I say, may it be so. And this this is where we must ask the Spirit of God to open our eyes and our ears and our hearts. This is where we want to humbly come before our God and ask him to wake us up to to the extent we need it and in the ways we need it, to wake us up to the brokenness and wrongness all around us. And yes, this includes the brokenness and wrongness in our own hearts and in our own homes and in our own families and within our community as a church. Yes, indeed, that is part of the revolution. But we don't stop there. No, it includes the brokenness and wrongness in our own neighborhoods and in our own workplaces and in our own city and in our world. In one of his famous sermons, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. highlighted the story, the famous story of Rip Van Winkle. Many of you will remember that from from middle or high school literature class, uh, written a fictional story written by Washington Irving about a man named Rip Van Winkle who lived in the American colonies out in the 1700s, and who one day wandered off into the hills, and there he fell asleep for 20 years. And when Rip woke up and came back into town, he was absolutely shocked by the amount of change that had happened in society in those 20 years. And 
By the way, I think it would be uh, super fascinating for somebody to write a modern day version of Rip Van Winkle. Um, can you imagine falling asleep in the year 2000? I mean, can you imagine falling asleep not 20 years ago, but even just six months ago now and waking up and looking around at our world and being shocked by the amount of change that has taken place? Well, that's what happened to old Rip. And again, when he woke up, he was shocked by the change. And Dr. King pointed out that one piece of the story that is often missed is that during those 20 years, the American Revolution had taken place. When, when Rip left town, the picture outside of town was of King George III of England. And when he came back into town, the picture was of President George Washington. Dr. King writes or said in the sermon, quote, when Rip Van Winkle looked up at the picture of George Washington, he was amazed. He was completely lost. He knew not who he was. And this reveals to us that the most striking thing about the story of Rip Van Winkle is not merely that Rip slept for 20 years, but that he slept through a revolution. While he was peacefully snoring up in the mountain, a revolution was taking place that at points would change the course of history. And Rip knew nothing about it. He was asleep. Yes, he slept through a revolution. Dr. King astutely pointed out that Rip Van Winkle slept through a revolution. And my brothers and sisters, it is so easy for us to do the same. And I believe that our King Jesus is saying again to me and to us, he is lovingly, firmly and even joyfully saying, wake up. Wake up to the extent and in the ways that we need to hear it. He is saying, wake up even more. Don't get lulled to sleep. Oh man, there are so many things in our culture and context that want to lull us to sleep. But this is a moment. I mean, there are no sports. There's no sports entertainment right now to lull us to sleep. And let's be honest, Netflix is getting kind of old. And so I believe the word is, wake up. And part of that, he is saying, don't listen to all of those other voices out there on either side or any side. He's saying, don't listen to all of those other voices. He's saying, no, listen to my voice and follow me and participate in my revolution. You see, church, it's possible to be part of a church even for one's entire life, and to still be asleep to this revolution. It is possible to know a lot about the scriptures and to be asleep to this revolution. It's impossible to know the songs and to even say the prayers and to do this and to that, to know this and to know that, to be involved in so many things and to still somehow be asleep to, the, to participating in what God is doing in the world around us. And as it relates to our particular cultural moment and, and racism, personal racism and systemic racism and our, our country's history and our current situation today. I want to say, it's important to say, that one part of this revolution is standing with the oppressed. That's part of the Jesus revolution, to stand with those who are hurting. And at the same time, I want to say today that it's possible to post and protest and still be asleep to this revolution. It is possible to be totally woke to all of it and still be asleep to this revolution. Church, be reminded, Northeast, I love you. And I, and I love that this is our heart. And I want to lovingly remind all of us today that we are invited to be part of the most beautiful revolution. A revolution that will not just overthrow one corrupt system in order to replace it with another corrupt system. No, this revolution is one that can truly, that can truly change things. And again, I say, may it be so. And of course, there is so much more that could be said and that should be said. But today, I'm stirring it up and I'm letting it sit. And by God's grace, we'll get to come back together next week and press in further and deeper. Again, 
This is a call to consider the question, to honestly, humbly, prayerfully, together with others, consider the question, what is our response to that which is deeply wrong in our world? What has been our response? And what is the Spirit of the living God saying ought to be our response going forward? Second, this is a call to get this ode to King Jesus deep and deeper within us. On our own, as couples, with our kids, and with our communities. Church, let's lean in and let's do this. Let's go for it together. And again, in all of it, here is the most important, most revolutionary word that we can say. Jesus. This revolution and our response to that which is wrong with our world is to be centered on Jesus and in the way of Jesus and in the name of Jesus. The only way our world will experience real and lasting, the real and lasting unity, peace, reconciliation, healing, equality, and change that it longs for is Jesus, King Jesus himself who had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave. He became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death and the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. And when we come to the, together to the table of the Lord's Supper, to, to his table, which we do every week when we gather together virtually or live via Zoom or in person. Oh, may that day come soon. We come to the table and we remember that the bread, his body, given up for us on the cross by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And the cup, his blood shed on our behalf for the forgiveness of our sins, for the forgiveness of all the ways that we have contributed to that which is wrong in our world. And all the ways we have sinned, all the ways that we have contributed to brokenness, all the ways that we have ignored the pain of others, all of it forgiven by his blood. And the cup points us to that forgiveness and to this new life that he has given us in right relationship with him and with one another and with the world. This new life of being now sent and empowered by God, revolutionaries in the name of Jesus. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus is the King to the glory of God the Father. My dear brothers and sisters, may God bless us and keep us and make his face shine upon us. May he be gracious to us and grant us wisdom and shalom. And may the result of it be that the city of Fort Wayne and the cities and nations around the world sing revolutionary songs, sing this revolutionary song for joy. And may the result of all of it be God's glory and honor and praise forever and ever in the name of King Jesus. And everyone agreed and said, Amen.